Wonderful. Hello, everybody. I know we've just got a couple of minutes to make sure everyone can can come into our cool meeting space and get themselves acclimated. But just wanted to say a big warm welcome to all of you. Um, we've had such great conversations these past two days already and really provocative and helpful content um, and good questions. So we're just going to be continuing. We're on a roll. We're going to continue to be on a roll for this last day and get a lot more engagement going on as well. Um, so thank you all for, for, for joining us. And for those who may not have been you know, tracking this earlier, because I know when you're in the meetings, it's harder to kind of tell how many people are there and um, who's coming from where, although I'm really happy that people have been using the chat to introduce themselves and say hello to each other. But we had nearly 200 on the first day and over 100 people yesterday. And I'm really um, just so heartened by that because I think there's just such interest in this topic. But what's most amazing to me about it is that people who have incredibly busy lives right now are librarians and our teachers who are dealing with so much because they're dealing with the public or they're dealing with all these students and all these parents are taking some time out to be here with us. And so I just wanna say a big thank you to those of you who have, who have found some time in your lives for this. Um, I really do hope that it's gonna make things easier for 2021 just to be able to have this um, cohort of people who that you can lean on and who are we're in it we're in it together in terms of trying to find ways to make it all work so so thank you I have a couple of things I'm going to say to get us started and then I'll be turning it over to various speakers and you can follow along in our um, the agenda that that is posted online and we'll and Angela may have already, yeah, we're going to put that in the in the chat for you so you can quickly um, yeah, there it is. Thank you so much, Angela. Angela Spitalette has been amazing throughout this process. She is our behind the scenes, our events coordinator for all things New America, but she's been spending a lot of time with me over these past three days on this forum. And I just have to say a big thank you, Angela. And so she'll be um, putting links in the chat. Um, another person I want to call out um, at, at New America who's been incredibly helpful is, um, and also behind the scenes is Fabio Mergia, who is one of our um, communications interns who's been doing a fantastic job on Twitter. Um, and so maybe many of you have seen some of the the conversation there um, and you can follow along. I'll just go ahead and put the uh, hashtag in here um, for you. You can follow along on Twitter that way after the fact um, um, or you can multitask and do it all <laughs> um, right now. Um, and then Jason Stewart and Riker, um, uh, Pastor Kiewicz at our um, New America offices have been wonderful too. So I'm um, really happy to see everybody coming in. We've got over 40 people here, which is fantastic. We're going to be sharing some things on screen, but trying to do as much as we can in gallery view. But one of the things I wanted to note, um, when we do have um, people speaking together, as we've shown on the agenda there, we have these kind of conversations set up to prime the pump before we go into workshops, feel free to use the view that's not gallery view, but to use speaker view. And some of you might have already set that um, already, but it's helpful but I've found in, in webinars, I mean, in meetings like this, um, when there's gonna be one or two people talking to you, speaker view. And then you can kind of zoom in on that person. There will be some times when we're sharing screens, we're gonna have a Google Doc that we're all working in a little bit later today. Um, and before I get to a little bit more about what's gonna happen later today, I do just wanna call out a couple of, of things that I wanted to make sure to mention before we're done with our, our moments together. Um, one of the great things about those surveys and a big thank you to so many of you who have been filling out our surveys is that we can get a sense of some questions that didn't we didn't have time to answer and some different things that we need to make sure that we um, raise. And one question that came in yesterday that was, um, are you gonna see me moving around because that noise is my dog knocking on the door. Um, so. Yes, of course, my dog. So one of the things that came up yesterday that we didn't have time to get to is um, somebody asked about the focus groups. Actually, it was Daria from Harford County in um, Maryland who asked about those focus groups and what we knew about the topics of those focus groups. Um, and it was a really good question and, and Deborah didn't have a chance to get to that. But I did want you to know that we, in designing those focus groups in Chicago and Skokie and Schaumburg, we 
tried to do recruitment in such a way that we could get a diversity of income, race, and ethnicity um, among the parents and educators who were coming to those focus groups. As many of you may know who we do that kind of research, it's, it's not so easy to do in the world of COVID-19 <laughs> and having to do things virtually. Um, and we'll have more data on the demographics when we are able to um, report back more formally on this. But we did have, through our library sites, we had distribution of flyers through food distribution um, areas in, in, in school districts and in, at public libraries, um, and through um, various kind of early learning groups that um, help low-income families. So our hope is that we have a diversity of income levels um, represented. So just wanted you guys to, to know that. Um, it's a really important question to be asking in terms of kind of what parent feedback we're getting. It's like, what, what do we know about the, the demographics of those parents? And one other thing I wanted to note, and I'm going to maybe just quickly share my screen here to show it to you all, is that um, there's a, a resource that we haven't mentioned yet, but that is incredibly um, valuable. I'm so sorry. Okay, hold on one second. I don't have it quite up yet. Um, and that is, it's called the Peer Coaching Media Mentorship Toolkit. And it was created two years ago by Harford County Public Library in Maryland, along with the um, other uh, Carroll County and Baltimore County. And it could be something that you use in your work in the future as well, especially if you're interested in doing some more professional learning with your with your own staff or with your peers. So I just, I'm putting it up here on screen so you can see this, see um, what it looks like. There's all sorts of information on how to do parent discussion groups, like what we've been trying to do in Chicago, um, how to do some of the evaluations and surveys that we're doing with this kind of work, et cetera. So I'll stop sharing my screen, but I just wanted to show you that really quickly. And let me just make sure there's not something else that I'm forgetting to tell you before I tell you about the breakout groups and we get into our, our, next, uh, our next speakers here. I did want you all to know the sessions are recorded um, and many people have been asking if we will have them available for review and, and watching later. Absolutely. That's one of the amazing things that Angela and Jason do for us, though, processing all this video and it'll be up on our, um, our events webpage by the end of this week, if not early next week. And we'll also send a follow-up email to everybody who's come so that you have a easy way, a, a link to all of these, um, these videos. We will not, however, be recording the breakout sessions, so don't have to worry about that. Um, the recording doesn't, doesn't work in the breakouts. Um, lastly, if anyone needs um, closed captioning, feel free to, to use that. Of course, it's part of um, our Zoom system here, but it's also um, something that we want to make sure is available to those if you do in a breakout session need closed captioning, send a note if you can to Angela um, or to New America Events, <laughs> um, aka Angela, and she can make sure that you're put in a breakout room that's in the main meeting space where we do have closed captioning for you. So, okay. Um, now, just one last housekeeping note. We are going to be doing breakouts, obviously. Um, and so the way we're going to set these up is we want to make sure that people um, can mix it up and meet each other. But we also um, have some worksheet kind of um, session work, essentially, for you to do fun work, but but a little bit of work. And we're trying to make sure that you're grouped in, in with people who have some of the same interests. So what we'd like you to do right now um, over the next couple of minutes is choose your topic for your breakout rooms. You can get into this Google Doc. Um, if you can fill it out in the next couple of minutes, that would be helpful. And um, Angela will start making assignments as our speakers are talking over the next 30 minutes or so, so that everybody is put into a breakout room that matches with an interest area. We have broken things out into three potential interest areas, trying to keep them as broad as possible. One is just on outreach and inclusion. Another is on how you might integrate some of the ideas that you've learned over the, or innovations um, that you've heard about over the past couple of days and integrate them into things you're already doing. And then a third topic is to really dive into media literacy um, specifically and how you might do that. So you can figure out where you want to be. We have amazing facilitators who will be with you in these rooms to kind of talk you through um, the, the worksheet that we'll put up later, but take a minute to, to choose your topic. All right, so 
think I've covered it in terms of our housekeeping. I'm really thrilled to introduce our our next two speakers for what we've built as a conversation on computational thinking, media mentorship, and on the ground learning with Double Dutch, um, which is gonna be just a really fun conversation. Um, we have with us Claudia Haynes, um, who you've I've introduced her before and you heard her as a speaker with me on the first day, who is a librarian at the Homer Public Library in Alaska and co-author of the book Becoming a Media Mentor. And um, we're so thrilled that she can be here with us again, along with Shamira Williams, who's the founder of CC Busy and um, STEM is Beautiful and also is an amazing entrepreneur and early childhood specialist in the Pittsburgh area. Shamira has been a fantastic kind of resource for me over the years as I'm getting to know um, both things happening in Pittsburgh because Pittsburgh, we've done some projects there, but also kind of thinking innovatively about the intersection of technology and young children. So I'm gonna pass it over to the two of you. I'd love it if you guys could start though by just telling me how you guys met because I know that Claudia and Shamira have also intersected in many ways over the past couple of years. And I think it'd be fun for our group to, to hear that story. Shamira, do you wanna start? Sure. Uh, hello, everyone. Claudia and I met through the Fred Rogers Center. Uh, Tanya Smith was working on a project to put library kits together for that community, and she wanted to add technology to the kits. That's when Ellie was first coming out. Um, it was a kiosk system that the Fred Rogers Center had for families and providers to be able to use for new technology with young children. So. That is actually how I met um, Claudia. And we didn't meet face to face till I think a few years later at uh, Tech Center. And I think what is important to note about our friendship and our work together is, is you know, Lisa pointed out that you're in Pittsburgh and you may have realized that I'm, all the way across the country in a very different community in um, uh, the rural community of Homer, Alaska, about 5,200 people. And I, I think that's important to note because, you know, on Tuesday I was talking about like inside um, the ideas and the community around media mentorship, there's been people in libraries, you know, people, um, educators, early childhood people, researchers, public policy, and people in all kinds of communities. And we've all kind of found um, common uh, challenges to work around for our community. And I, and I think it's, uh, you're and I, the experience you and I have had in our communities is I think interesting and fun as we kind of go forward in our conversation. Yes, because I live in the city of Pittsburgh and actually with the Fred Rogers Center is about 45 minutes away, which is not in the city of Pittsburgh. So, you know, we've, we've just made this we've made three different communities or four different communities intersect and connect around technology and young children. Exactly. So I'm gonna ask the first question. How, how does media literacy, given we're talking about Fred Rogers and talking about your work in early childhood, how does media literacy play out in your work with young children and early childhood educators? So with young children, I will say as a designer, it is important for me to make sure that uh, young children are a part of my product testing process, right? I wanna know how they are experiencing technologies and how they are experiencing the media and what impact does it have on them? So CC Busy um, was, is about child care providers being able to use an Alexa or a Google Assistant to log their daily interactions. And while the device in the program was designed for adults to use the technology, my first question was, what kind of impact is that going to have on the children in the environment, right? So that's a media issue, right? Because they are constantly hearing that adult talk. And in early childhood, we know that that is essential, right? They're learning their names in that format. They're learning how to have a conversation, right? And if it's a conversational, it's called conversational computation. My first question is, 
we don't want to brand kids. I didn't want to hear kids saying Alexa all day or okay, Google, right? Because that was the first thing that a child was going to mimic, right? We've seen the Alexa, the baby shark video, right? And the next question was, okay, well, I can use the invocation of computer, but this is not actually a computer. So that wouldn't be the right term to teach kids. And then echo was the best word though, right? And so I spent a lot of time observing how are kids interacting with the adult as they use that device. So that's one way I will say that I work with young children. Um, I worked on a team for a public art project to build an interactive table for children. So it was important for me to make sure that I was able to observe how were the children interacting with the table when we designed it. Um, the table is designed that children tap the top of the table. They have to match the cards to the tabletop that's illustrated. And when they do, they hear stories from community members that they would see all the time in that community. And so for me, it was one, how do we select the community members and them to tell their story? What kind of stories should they be telling children? How often do we need this story to change? How relatable does this story need to be to a child and the adult that is interacting with them? And so that's where my work is with young children directly. Um, in regards to early childhood educators, I really like to focus on doing pro professional development to help them think about the multitudes of uh, media they can use, right? My walls have magnetic primer on them, right? There's an abstraction built into my wall. Kids can play all the time for problem solving. And so it's how do we help providers think about other ways to integrate different things into their environments where they may say like, I don't have space to do STEM or I don't have space to do computational thinking. I don't have space, you know, I don't have access to technology, but there are other ways to start those um, thinkings and interactions with children without actually needing a piece of technology at first. So that's how I'll say that it, you know, that's where my work is, but uh, I will ask you now, what is computational thinking? I know you're just throwing that phrase around and, you know, I, I assume that there are uh, people participating who are either thinking, what does that even mean? Or, oh, it must mean computer science and how does that fit with young kids? And um, I think it's important to kind of talk about what computational thinking or CT is. Um, and while there's not a universally agreed upon definition, most people, researchers or practitioners think of it as an kind of an expressive or creative process that helps children and adults, as Shamira was just talking about, um, design high and low tech solutions to say a problem or a, a slate of tasks that can then be replicated by others. And I, I think it's important to talk about kids and adults in there and the low tech and high tech solutions, which I think this is a perfect example of media mentorship in action. Um, and as I said, often computational thinking or CT as I like to call it is associated with computers and, and making digital content. Um, but it's really used in a lot of different types of fields and, and they're related, but not exactly the same. Um, and so CT includes kind of two parts. One is a set of skills that include logic, evaluation, decomposition, pattern recognition, which those of you involved in early literacy might uh, recognize those two ideas. Um, and then there's algorithm design and abstraction. But then there's this whole other part of CT that's kind of the CT mindset part. And that includes um, dispositions. Some people call those soft skills, but they're absolutely essential for 21st century thinking. So I, I feel like soft is uh, not the right term. Um, but those include collaboration or working with others to achieve a goal, confidence in dealing with complexity, persistence in working through challenging problems, tolerance for ambiguity. We have lots of ambiguity in the world, right? 
um, ability to deal with the open ended problems, creative expression, um, and then questioning concepts and ideas taken for granted. So in your paper, why did you focus on young children? So um, Shamir is talking about a paper that we published in August and Shamira was on the advisory board that looked at the paper um, that's talking about computational thinking and young children and early learning in libraries. Um, and I'll kind of backtrack a little bit because several years ago, I started looking at CT computational thinking in the library environment more closely as part of um, the American Library Association's Libraries Ready to Code project. And uh, like, like some of you, um, my, my community and kids in my community had really limited access to computer science learning. At the time, there were no computer science classes at the high school and really limited experiences um, for younger kids, even with what I could offer at the library. And so I started wondering, hmm, my little community, how could, how could I help kids be prepared to create digital content, not just consume it and, and really use their voice to participate in local and national dialogue, even if they didn't live near Silicon Valley or Pittsburgh or really any sort of tech hub. There's, I mean, there's minimal tech happening in my community, right? And so I started looking at kind of deeper into providing CT experiences with low and high tech tools, right? especially with girls who I recognize were underrepresented in any sort of robotics club. There were no girls in the time at the time, or even in the library STEM program. So I thought about what's the missing, what's the gap there. And so then I started kind of diving deeper and deeper and looking at how some of these skills and dispositions could actually be introduced with young children, particularly preschoolers, with this idea that you know, we could build a foundation just like we do with early literacy or early math so that they would be ready to delve into these kind of bigger ideas when the tech experiences were more available or when their interests started to queue in. And so I started kind of talking to other people and realized, oh my gosh, wow, other people are thinking about these same ideas, um, particularly like Paula, Lang pa Paula Langsam at the DC Public Library. Uh, Katie Campana and Jackie Kosobuk at the Kent State iSchool. Um, and we kind of started thinking about, oh, well, wait, you know, decomposition happens with preschoolers when they're um, sounding out words, like when they're playing with the app Mixamal by Yada Toy, or they're using uh, abstraction to retell stories they've heard using finger puppets or building stories using algorithm design with Scratch Jr. And so all these things kind of started to, to play out. And of course, Shamira, you and I have talked a lot about CT mm -hmm. um, and particularly CT infused activities that kids and families are already doing and how to kind of tease out those, those strands um, and, and draw attention to them and kind of use low tech. So I'm wondering, maybe you could chime in and talk about some of your examples of that. So my favorite example that I actually showcased, I think at the tech center in 2008 was jump rope, right? So jump rope got me thinking because it was simple. I was actually asked to talk about some things that would, you could provide in community for low tech that you know could start thinking about technology. I think it was in a pre ISTE event um, that, was, that I was at and so, I thought a jump rope was perfect, right? Jump ropes are easy to, you know, easily accessible, you know, diverse. Nobody has like not heard of a jump rope and they were really low cost, right? I went to Home Depot and just actually had them cut a piece of rope to make me a jump rope. And it cost me what, a dollar and two cents because it's like 22 cents. But then I remember teaching kids how to jump rope in preschool and it's hard it's harder than you think because you're like no just jump rope and he's like no you actually have to teach them the skill of jumping over the rope first like jump left jump right jump left jump right okay let's get that rhythm going and then i remember akila the bee 
okay, well, that's a great movie. But in that movie, we've seen her spell words out multiple times. And I was like, oh, that's just like the drum, you know, in early literacy when they say, clap your name out. And then I got this, uh, I watched a TEDx video by Karen, Kara Gaunt, and it was about Double Dutch. And it was about the small room, it was the big idea um, TED Talk. And she talked about how the jump rope and, this, and the sound and the tic-tac sound. And I was like, oh, the pattern, right? You have to, if you do double dutch, it is a complex activity. The, the choreograph and choreography that is required for the three people that actually double dutch, right? Because double dutch requires two ropes and there's two turners. Those two turners are the most quintessential part of double dutch, right? They turn the rope, they set the rhythm, they set the pace so that people, the other person can jump inside that space. But then I realized, oh, jump rope was a competition and it had timing that needed to be done. So there was data collection that parents could do. How much faster can you get by doing this work? And then I was like, oh, well, there's decomposition right in there. And then there was a little bit of abstraction because what happens when you're just jump ring rope and you need to think about it, right? You need to, you need to just move on the dime. If you've ever jumped rope, you know that feeling or when is it time to go? But at the most simple part, it was jump rope had if then statements in the songs, right? Everybody knows the jump rope, the classic jump rope. When I call your birthday, please jump in. If it's not your birthday, you cannot jump in which is a great way to start talking about an if-then statement. Let's talk about the other constraints that jump rope can offer you. What happens when there's only two people that want to jump rope? You could either take turns by using that one rope or how many people have, what do you do with the other end of the rope when there's only two people? You tie it, yes. You tie it to something else so that the two of you can play. Now, how many of us have met up with our cousins in the summertime and we're all going to sing the jump rope song, right? But as soon as you start Miss Mary, Mac, Mac, every neighborhood, every community has their own version of that song, right? And so now we were having this whole conversation about, well, jump rope had media literacy in it automatically, all the songs we sang. The songs had instructions in them. The game, offered, the game offers its own complexity and creativity all at one time. And it was a space that was typically for girls. Doesn't have to be only for girls, but it was a space that was typically for girls. And then I got Karen Gaunt's book, The Girls Black Girls Play. And it says, learning the ropes from double Dutch to hip hop. If you haven't had a chance to watch the video, her TED Talk video, I'll drop the link because it's a great five minute exploration of how jump rope turns into double dutch, turns into music and hip hop. And then I think of music is the only language that you, you know, like math is both auditory and sound. And at that, it is kinetic orality. And that's what she really talks about in this book. And that's what, was interesting to me about computational, I mean, about jump rope and double dutch as a way to think about it. And it's also something that you only can learn by another human teaching you. There's no written instructions for double dutch. It is something that is intergenerational that you have to do with someone else. So your aunt teaches you or your mother teaches you or the older girls on the block teach you. It's not something that you learn alone. You know, I think that is a really, really valuable part of what you're talking about, because I think, you know, when I was started seeing more and more of these ideas like this and kind of integrating them into, say, story time, where it was kind of a captive audience, enthusiastic audience, 
but a place where we had young kids and their grownups. And so introducing CT to both generations at the same time so they could take them home and explore these really accessible examples. But I think one of the biggest moments that I think these kind of ideas typify is, is that it, it makes the idea of how computers work and who programs computers really human-centered. And for grownups to suddenly see, oh, I understand how algorithm design works or abstraction works or decomposition. And they say, that, oh, it's just like, you know, reading a sentence or it, it brings this human element to computers. And for people who, who, who don't necessarily think about how computers work, it's like, oh, right, there are people who used these experiences to develop these ways of programming, right? Instead of just the computer magically learning how to program on its own, right? And so I, I think it's that a great, great strand to pull out there that real human connection. And so I got to ask for those who might be at this point thinking, so what does CT have to do with media literacy? <laughs> what would you say? I will say that first, um, both of them are a mindset, right? A mindset that requires you to shift from being a consumer driven base to a produ production base, right? If you wanna be a media mentor, you need to make media. If you want to participate in computational thinking, you actually have to do some problem solving, right? You gotta, you gotta get in the muck of that and figure it out. Um, both of them require you to be creative and create, but that's not enough, right? We've all created something or some form of media. It's the sharing. It's the vulnerability of sharing it that actually changes it, right? Creativity takes courage. And, vul and that's a Henry Matisse quote, right? So it's a, it's a thing that you actually not only need to have the confidence to create it, but you have to have the confidence to share it because in the vulnerability, right? Because the vulnerability is the sound of the truth and the feelings like courage. Truth and courage aren't always comfortable and they're never weakness. And that was, that's Breon Brown. And at that point, vulnerability, is like any other social, you know, it requires somebody else to have an opinion on your work. And can they assist? And can they give feedback and exchange feedback? And that's what it is. It's not like, it's, my idea is great to me. Everybody loves their own idea. It's when you exchange it with somebody else and can accept the feedback and be willing to refine it or be willing to have enough confidence to say, I don't want to refine it. It is intentionally designed this way so that these people can use it that way and having an understanding of it. Um, and so those two things are the same, right? That goes for media too. When people design media, whether it's posters, images, um, songs, it is designed for it to be used in a certain way and felt in a certain way. And when people design their algorithms, it's the same thing. That's why some people can say, you can tell someone's code by the way they wrote it, right? Because you are still writing, you are still producing something. And once you become a designer and a producer and a creator of something, that thread comes through all of your work all the time. And I think it is that soft skill, which is really not a soft skill because the world can be cool. You can think, oh, my design was awesome. And people are like, no. Or they're like, I don't really get it. Or it doesn't relate. And so you always have to be willing to refine it and, and shift it and understand where it stands. And that is in media and computational thinking. And so it is much more the dispositions that you have to have in both of those fields in order to push through. Yeah, I think kind of wrapping it up, I think one of the things that you're talking about that, you know, connects then to media mentorship is this idea of, of whose voice matters and how we decide who gets to create. And I, and I think that 
kind of what we have both talked about and done is, is introduce these very accessible computational thinking moments to kind of expand and broaden the idea of whose voice matters and, and help creators actually kind of design and create these high quality media artifacts and, and, and ideas. Um, so I, I think we, we kind of have to move on, but thank you, Shamira, for sh sharing all of your, your great insights. It's really good to see you. Oh my gosh. But yes, and yeah. Claudia as well. Um, what a fascinating conversation. It's kind of mind blowing. I think for a lot of us, it's really exciting and interesting and finding those connections between things. So I'm going to move us now into a really, another incredibly kind of innovation oriented, but also um, concrete conversation with Amber Krieger and Elena Lopez. I'm so thrilled they're with us today. And I'm gonna briefly introduce them and then hand it over to Amber. Um, Amber Krieger, uh, sorry, Amber Krieger is um, the services director at Schomburg Township District Library. And I do want to say a special thanks to Amber before I um, go on, because this whole project that we're doing with the Illinois Media uh, Mentorship Project with Illinois Libraries would not have happened if it wasn't for Amber. She was gracious enough to have lunch with me after an ALA session way back in June of 2019 um, or maybe it was dinner I can't remember I there was so much <laughs> going on and I said I really want to do this project and I think we might be able to get some funding but I need introductions to librarians and um, do you mind giving this a shot and she had so many good ideas and um, really made it happen so big big thanks Amber to you for that um, so Amber is going to be talking with Elena Lopez who is um, an amazing person in her own right mm -hmm. and has written um, in many forums around about family engagement. Um, she'll be talking about the idea book. Um, I'm sure she'll be introducing in their conversation. Um, she's the founder of the Global Family um, Oh goodness, I don't have it right in front of me and I'm suddenly blanking. Yes, Global Family Engagement Project um, and co-editor of the Idea Book. So um, thank you so much, Elena, for joining us for this. And um, I'm gonna pass it over to both of you now. Thank you. Great, thank you, Lisa. It's really exciting to be here today and to be, um, I get to talk to Elena Lopez. So that's really exciting, yay. Um, first, I wanna let everybody know that during this conversation, we wanna invite you guys to participate in the dialogue as well. So um, Elena are gonna talk back and forth and then there's gonna be cues that I'm gonna ask your, for your input. But you know, of course it's chat so you can always input whenever you want, but we're gonna have specific questions for you, okay? So, um, with COVID-19 pandemic, what we've noticed is, and it what has really been brought to the forefront, is the role of parents and other family members in children's learning, both in school and at home. So Elena, what have you learned from your research about family engagement in public libraries? First of all, I'd like to thank Lisa for the opportunity to share uh, my research and documentation about family engagement uh, in public libraries uh, with this audience. So let me start with family engagement. What is it? Um, family engagement refers to the shared roles of families, schools, and communities to promote children's learning. And for families, that means communicating the value of education through their beliefs, their attitudes, and their behaviors. Uh, and for public libraries, it's providing opportunities, including media mentorship, to families so that they can support their children's learning. Family engagement is integral to educational equity. Family is central in the lives of many immigrant families and people of color. Our research showed that libraries um, provide opportunities for families to learn together, to strengthen the parent and child bond, to access lifelong learning opportunities for adult family members, as well as for children and youth, and to promote social connections among parents and build community. So family, Engagement today, as Amber mentioned, is really on the forefront 
of the educational arena. And for families, that means not only motivating their children to learn in a virtual environment, but also reversing learning loss. And I think that libraries offer enriching experiences that can you know, be part of the effort to revert learning loss. Libraries can also support families so that families feel less pressured. And we know that families today um, face a lot of challenges trying to balance work and family life. Okay, so it's, you know, what, what are the possibilities then for libraries to innovate during this period um, so as to address the two contexts you just mentioned? Okay, so let me talk first about um, what I understand about innovation. So innovation is a novel way of addressing a problem, which is different from being original, something that nobody else has tried before and you're the first one to do it. Um, innovation in your library might be taking several of the ideas that you've learned over the past two days and adapting them to your library situation. That's an innovation. So a research, uh, and Lisa mentioned the idea book, uh, we have in that idea book what we found out to be five ways in which libraries have tried to engage families and have been successful in their efforts. So the first two I would put together are reach out and raise up family voices. And yesterday it struck me in that word cloud, the words that came out were access and empowering. And that is what reaching out and raising up really means. Access um, meaning reaching out to families and asking questions, listening to them, but more importantly, I think is raising up their voices. And that is empowering when families are one of the many drivers that shape library services and programming. So let me give you one example. Uh, in our forthcoming book, um, a librarian's Guide to Family Engagement in Learning, we asked uh, a couple of librarians uh, in rural Pennsylvania to write an article. And what they uh, wrote about was reaching out and listening to families. Families used to tell librarians, you know, your programming for children is so confusing. I wanna bring my kid there and the other sibling wants to come but is either too young or too old to participate in the program. So the librarian said, well, age is but a number. And what's so interesting is that the adult services uh, librarian and the youth services librarian got together and formed a family program open to all members of the family mm -hmm. so that they could learn and have fun together. So that's one example probably to hear more from you. <laughs> Great. I'm going to say during COVID, you know, this has been, a, for me, it's been a real um, great opportunity to be innovative and, you know, listen to my peers around Illinois and steal. I'm going to say innovative is another word for steal sometimes because um, we like to borrow and um, bring those ideas back to our neighborhood. I mean, back to our neighborhood. Yes. So what I want to ask um, everybody out there is, how are you, during this time of COVID, it's particularly hard to actually make contact with our families and engage with them. So um, how are you actually going about finding out what are the needs and the interests of your families during this time? And I think this is, <laughs> I, I'm curious to see what other people are doing because it's really hard because we're not seeing them face to face. And that's how we relied on them before. And if you remember from Devorah yesterday, talking about some families didn't even realize the library was open or some families didn't only recognize us for books. So how are we reaching out to our families and finding out what their needs are and then how are we meeting them or what even other interests? Does anybody, you can chat. I'm gonna sit here. Oh, so people are joining Facebook group for virtual school parents in the community. That's a great idea. Definitely, it was interesting when Devorah also pointed out that a lot of people were turning for advice, right, in, in media mentorship to Facebook and social media. So we should be there too. That's a definite yes. Great idea. 
So a part of me is like, sometimes on those community groups, you're like, oh, <laughs> some of the things that people say. Anyways, um, our school librarian at the high school has noted that public libraries are available for book clubs, re partnerships, definitely. Email lists have been really key. So they're, gonna, they're starting to flow in really fast. Facebook parent discussion group, um, online surveys, calling and asking what they're interested in. And then reaching out to kids so they can um, ask for advice and materials, emailing or calling parents and having conversations with them. So this is all great. Um, so I think we're going to move on to the next R. Elena. Yes. Yeah, sure. And the, the third R is reinforcing educational values. Um, all families want their children to learn and to succeed. But I think the challenge for libraries is how do you create a joyful learning experience through your collections and your programs? So family engagement is important from early childhood all the way through young adulthood. And um, I'm going to give some examples of how, you know, uh, one library and an, another one would be a group of parents try to create this joyful learning experiences, but they're for older kids. And I think um, it's important to think about, you know, what happens after the kids enter kindergarten. There was a, um, a study done by Scholastic that shows that reading tends to decline once kids are reach about the age nine and yet that's such an important transition in the lives of children because they're moving from learning to read to reading to learn and so you have to have that motivation uh, to become an avid reader and so um one of the things that we found out through our documentation is that it's important to include families and give them teaching roles over the summer um, my local library had a civics kids program that involved a father and his uh, fourth grade daughter. And what they did was virtually to give, um, you know, civics education and included a virtual field trip to the police department mm -hmm. and to the courthouse and interviewing the police officer and one of the judges. Um, one of the things that we found out in our research, um, and Lisa is part of the, uh, one of the contributors to our forthcoming book where she pointed out the same thing too, is that make learning fun as you design your programs for the whole family. And so the example I'm going to give is from my daughter and two other mothers, um, they, they live overseas. And what they did over the summer was to create bibliotech which is a virtual book club for kids seven to 11 years of age. Um, they read one book over a period of one month and they meet four times to discuss the book chapter. But in between the meetings, the kids have activities. And so it's an expansion of the digital world into the real world mm -hmm. in which they live. And they use uh, crafts and arts materials, do any number of things that like they've created a zoological diary using crayons and pens and paper. Um, they've created finger puppets to represent the characters in the story. They use old boxes to create the settings of the story. And for me, what was most interesting was that they interviewed parents and grandparents to find out what their stories were that related to the theme of the book. And on the, um, on the last day of their meeting, the fourth meeting, they all had a celebration with dancing, singing, laughter, and bringing the family together. And I think when children are happy and engaged, this relieves the pressure that families face. 
So this program is run by three mothers and together they reached about 20 children mm -hmm. over the summer. And I was thinking this might be something of an idea for libraries so they can do with their literacy volunteers and even with interns who are pursuing their master's degree in, um, in library sciences and want to work with children and youth. It's, I, I can't agree with you more. It's so important to make your programs fun. And, you know, a real focus that our library has been to make them multi-generational, right? So that it's a learning experience that's fun for everybody. So my, I guess my question is to all the librarians, how are you, how are you doing these types of programming at your library? So how are you building upon and enriching the learning experiences for um, um, children, teens, your adult families? I'm, Everybody, how are you um, doing this? So, I'm trying to read, and this is, I can't read and speak at the same time. <laughs> I'm just gonna tell you this. I'm trying, folks, but I feel like all of a sudden I've become a little bit um, dyslexic, if that makes any sense. Um, so, um, Etty has an amazing joyful program at their library for families where people share their pets and stuffed animals. Oh, I love this idea. So it's like you bring them on and then everybody gets to sh oh, um, that would be totally joyful because what kid doesn't love their stuffed animal and want to share them, right? Um, so Kristen, there's scaffolding activities. So there are easy activities for the youngest participants and more self-driven activities for the older children and adults. Definitely. I also like it when you um, are able to make the, the child the teacher in the situation, right? And trying to get to flip that role so you give the um, youth some agency. Um, I think that's really cool when you can do that. Like, for example, I don't make examples of crafts when I have programs because <laughs> sometimes I have parents that take over that craft if they're like, it's supposed to look this way. But um, we all know there's no you know it doesn't have to look that way um in non-covid times um lori says they had successful family engineering challenge programs so giving them a challenge and having the family work together i'm assuming is what that probably looks like um lori is virtual stem programs for first second third graders with their parents working together and then maria we have virtual component to our take and make bags for teens um, our tag teens take on learning the craft ahead of time to be the instructors of the program. Do the teens then also create the craft like ahead of, I mean, so they're the instructors, but do they come up with the program, Maria? I just wonder, because that's, that's cool. Um, sometimes, all right, yeah, cool. Um, so I'm going to move on. I think we have time for our last R's. We have a couple more R's in our five. We've only gotten three. Is that correct? So, That's Elena. Right. so um, <laughs> the last the last two are relate and reimagine library services, especially now during uh, the period of uh, the pandemic, as well as you know larger issues that have to do with uh, social justice. Um, so really it refers to um, the connections among parents and families. And there's just a ton of research that shows that it's important for families to have peer connections and acquaintances because it relieves some of the, uh, it provides support and relieves some of the pressure on them. So it, it is a larger context then of creating a home environment that is conducive to learning. And I, I know now that you have joined Facebook groups. There are parent groups that you can form uh, through your library and not be, need all the time to be on parenting, but on other interests that families have. The next one is on reimagining library services. And again, I go back to the word cloud that we had yesterday and collaborate was one of the key terms that appeared. So reimagining library services often involves collaboration, especially when it comes to reaching underserved families. And um, I like this example of what the Boston Public Library has done. It partnered with local bookstores and bought books from the local bookstores and the bookstores then were responsible for bringing them to about seven or eight uh, pre-identified and vetted um, nonprofit organizations that deal directly 
with um, underserved populations, so the jobless, the homeless, those without internet access. And the nonprofit organizations provided the library, the Boston Public Library, with um, you know, the types of genres that would appeal to uh, their uh, customers. And it covered you know, adult books, teens, as well uh, as children. So I think this is a good example of how you can reach out to co your community, provide, you know, create these partnerships so that you are able to distribute books and other resources, spe especially to those that don't have internet access and can't Zoom like us, uh, what, like what we're doing right now. Um, lastly, um, I, I just want to say that it's, this is a period of experimentation, um, finding out what works and what doesn't work for different groups of families. And so I think evaluation uh, is an important part of the work that uh, you are doing. Um, there is a trend now towards equitable evaluation. And I think one question that you might consider asking as you create, as you create programs, as you develop your collection, especially around eBooks and e-resources is, the question would be, to what extent does my library increase access, representation, and participation in the library's uh, collections and mm -hmm. services, especially for the underserved. Um, do I have a little more time or not? No, unfortunately, I'm going to have to say that we have to end this conversation, okay. Elena. Um, thank you for all the great ideas. Everyone check out the idea book. And with that, um, I'm going to have to turn this over to Lisa. Thank you again, Elena. Good thank time. you, Amber. So I, I love it. And, um, and thanks so much. Yeah, I'm going to move us along because, well, I'm going to shorten the amount of time we have for this moment of reflection, but it is an important moment. Um, we're about to move into our breakout sessions. But before we do that, we want to capture a little bit of what you have experienced, all of the participants here have experienced. We're going to put a link in the chat to the survey. And we're going to give you some time right now to start filling out the survey because what we're thinking, in, instead of having it at the end, we want to give you a few minutes to just reflect on what you've heard, these amazing conversations, and think about them in terms of your own work in your spaces, in your classrooms, in your children's sections, in your youth services programming, and start um, imagining as you're filling out the survey what this really means for you and what this might lead you to be able to do next um, in 2021. Um, can be little baby steps. It doesn't have to be huge, big new programs. And we'll talk a little bit about that right before the breakouts. But we're gonna um, just put on some music for a minute. We're just gonna pause and reflect and take the survey. Um, we'll be back in like four minutes. Okay, we should we can start moving on. Feel free to, to, to keep filling it out. We're also gonna have a few minutes at the end um, because I'm sure you weren't able to get through it all right now. Um, but there are, just want to big, actually, to make a big shout out to Elaine Zarnecki, our um, Zarnecki, I'm sorry, Elaine, I just realized I probably have been mispronouncing your last name. You can correct me. Um, you got it right. Zarnecki. Okay. <laughs> Signing these surveys and helping us throughout this whole project. Um, they have really been helpful. They're gonna be provided, um, it's all anonymous of course, but to provide it to the directors of the libraries who are part of the project, but also will be part of the way we are um, reporting on the insights from this generally. And we hope they help you um, think about what you're doing. So next, breakouts. What we're gonna do is have you go into the um, rooms. Angela, um, our amazing Wizard of Oz in the background has been assigning everybody to their rooms based on the topics that you're interested in. Um, our facilitators um, are going to just help to make kind of keep us on time, but also um, lead you um, to introduce yourselves quickly and then um, answer a couple of questions in a shared document that all of us, all 49 of us are going to be in um, right now. And I want to make sure, of course, that I've got my uh, the correct um, permissions on this document um, before um, let me set, I'll, I'll try to make sure that, that well, it's, once we get in there, but want to get you guys into your breakout rooms right now um, so that you can start working on this, this document, going to the section of the document that that refers to the topic area you are interested in. So Angela, feel free to 
get everyone assigned and we'll see you all back here in about 20 minutes. So thanks everybody and have fun in your breakouts. It was just getting juicy. <laughs> Fun to see you, Denise. I'm so glad you're with us. Oh, uh, thank you. I think I took up too much time in the other group. <laughs> I was so excited to see people, humans. How are you? <laughs> Very good. Yeah, it is, it is nice to see humans. So Denise, we'll have to talk offline, but um, my Australian relatives, one of my, my cousins is actually with me right now, the next three weeks, waiting, trying to get back to Australia. So. Mm, that, I think they'll be there for a long time. She's mm. waiting for a flight. I'm um, sorry. Man. So it's really good to see everyone coming back in. Great. Oh, I guess we still have another 15 people to join us here. Good. Hope that was um, a good, I was flitting in and out of some of the meeting rooms. I wish I could have been in all of them just to hear all the good ideas. Um, and I'm excited to see how many ideas were put down on that worksheet, you know, just to see all of that um, mind work <laughs> happening, like in real time through the fingertips of various people all around the, the world at the same time is pretty amazing. Um, so, okay, welcome back, everybody. What we're going to do now is um, just quickly you know, kind of one minute each, just go through and have a, a little bit of a report back on some um, things that were shared during that time together. I do hope that for those of you who kind of got to the point of some concrete things, you put wrote that down somewhere else for yourself or put a note in your calendar or on your to-do list somewhere so that you can um, keep up with that. Just a big thanks to our facilitators for making that possible. And um, I'm just going to go down the line in my own little internal list here and call on you all um, one after the other to just give a one minute report back. So I have Claudia at the top of my list. So Claudia, what was your, your conversation like? Oh, we need to um, the mute. Sorry. Oh, no, sorry. Um, I think a lot of us uh, kind of connected with um, the, the idea of, of reaching out to parents and them being a key part of kind of this work around media mentorship right now. And in some cases, the reluctance on parents part to kind of, um, be mentors, but that seemed to be kind of an idea that really resonated um, and people kind of talked about some ideas that have been working and some that have not. Um, we did touch on ha having better access to media that um, has diverse characters and diverse experiences and how um, to get that into the hands of um, families that are struggling with access to the library right now. Um, but I, I, I heard parents brought up multiple times um, which I think was kind of really, really telling about where we are and where we are in this discussion about screen time and how it's affecting families' access to information and learning right now. Amber, you're up next. Do you quick, quick report back? Yeah, totally. So um, um, a lot of our conversation really stemmed around inequities and how do you um, actually meet the needs of the people in your community? Um, and so we talked about partnerships, potential partnerships, and how can you expand your reach out into the community when um, your doors are closed. Um, so um, uh, we also talked about, you know, what we want to do in the future when the library does reopen. And um, really um, finding ways to hear different people's voices um, within our community so that we can do um, um, better meet their needs. So that's a quick wrap up. If I missed anything, anybody, you can go ahead and type it into the chat. Thanks. Oh yeah, that's a good idea, Amber. For those of you who might have an idea you wanna share, if we don't get to it, please jump in that way. And people can read it on the document too. So I'll go now to Amy Kuster. Yeah, so in our group, we talked a lot about um, the piece that really resonated was how a lot of these um, concepts are already present in what we're doing. 
and we have a lot of intention around how do we make that more intentional so that it can be more impactful. Mm -hmm. So one of the big like within the next month pieces is revisiting all of the resources and looking at what we've already got planned to deliver because we know kids and teens are going to be into that and integrate these pieces in a way that like is organic rather than trying to come up with something completely new. Interesting. Yeah, organic, but also intentional at the same time, right? It's that combination. So Caroline Broren. Yes, uh, I was just going to say that it's, our groups were talking about some of the same things, Amy, um, and the word intentional definitely came up, uh, certainly in thinking about um, the, like, the accessibility of online programming and thinking about universal design and, and accessibility issues that are part of um, the programs that we do and, and really trying to, to, to think through some of the, the problems that face us with that, but how we can overcome them. Um, also, um, just some of the practical things, you know, about um, small things that we can do by like including some media tips, like we would do our early childhood asides in a story time um, for parents and also coming up with resources and things that we can share um, with our colleagues as well as our patrons um, so that they're uh, not those huge leaps, but as Elena kind of talked about with um, what innovation is, is just making small adjustments to what you're already doing. Um, and I think that's definitely something that we um, saw and that some of the, the same kinds of things, looking at resources, really getting more familiar with those so that we um, have greater confidence in that in the, the next month. Um, and kind of thinking about plans, you know, like sharing things with our colleagues um, and, 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 and expanding the message. Uh, beyond just the people who are able to attend this. There was a last minute question of, you know, are the, the recordings gonna be available? Yes, yes, of course, because we wanna be able to share this with more people that couldn't necessarily attend live. So that was great. Yeah, that's a really important way to extend it. So Stuart, Stuart Greiner, for those who might not know, um, is also with Chicago Public Library. And thanks so much, Stuart, for joining us as a facilitator for this and also for being a big part of the reading chats back in August. So over to you, Stuart. Yeah, thank you. This was super fun. Um, so we talked um, about um, using, some people are using uh, different kinds, or trying to use different kinds of media, mixing it up in like story time and that kind of thing. Um, and we, uh, someone mentioned that they feel like parents are paying attention now more than they maybe they would in an in-person story time because it is on camera. Um, so being modeling for parents and that kind of thing. Um, and then um, kind of our main thing though was like, how can we not necessarily incorporate media into an existing program, but use media to promote those existing programs? Um, so one thing uh, someone mentioned was going back and talking to their colleagues about like what media they're comfortable with what media can be used um, to promote to parents, uh, like the family Facebook groups. You know, we talked a little bit about that. Um, and that's kind of the gist of what we talked about. So. Yeah, very smart flip there. I like that. Dorothy, over to you. Uh, yes, um, we had some great examples in terms of programs that are, are already being conducted to maybe bring out some of this media literacy uh, skills, such as looking at photos of impossible images and having a conversation around that, um, having apps and games that middle schoolers, for example, might evaluate, and uh, also including different content areas, social issues, civics, to, to engage in, in topics as well. Um, and, uh, we talked about uh, making these programs fun so that it could be, for example, a cooking program, but trying to interweave some of the media literacy skills into, into that. Uh, another example was uh, Be Safe Online plus Book History Meets 3D. So there, there was a whole piece around um, promoting 3D printing, but interweaving that, that safety online. Um, but also in terms of evaluation, something quick, and I think a lot of people are doing different kinds of easy ways to get some feedback. Somebody had mentioned Flipgrid, sort of like a, a little blog takeaway. And, uh, but 
those anecdotes are really great. Um, there was a teen that said that one of the things he learned through, through a gaming program was um, how important it is to speak up and be confident to speak up and be able to express himself even when nobody else is saying anything, but he feels something needed to be said. So that kind of impact we're looking for. And it's, it, we were saying it's a treasure when you can get that kind of feedback. Mm -hmm. And then over to Elaine. I know we're getting short on time here, but Elaine. Yes, yes. Well, we had many of the same conversations and with media literacy, we really talked about how libraries are doing so much with media literacy in their programs, but making that connection more intentional and maybe looking back at your programs that you're already doing and seeing where you're making those great connections. We also talked about all the wonderful resources that have been made available for these past three days and really taking some time to look at them um, and see where those pieces can fit in before planning those next steps. Um, one of our participants had a new teen area and they were really connecting with the idea of um, how to reach teens without saying that you're talking to them about media literacy, but how to get them excited about all the different things that they can do, so. Fabulous, really cool. I'm glad we could have those moments for people to talk together. There's so much expertise here in the room, right? I mean, everyone's got really good ideas on how to do this. So we're gonna wrap up now. Um, I'm just, incredibly grateful to all of you for spending the time for just kind of doing some of the deep thinking and the exciting kind of creative thinking around this. Um, I'm going to just quickly note um, a couple of things from the previous days that we want to make sure you know about. There's the new guide to media mentorship that we published on Tuesday. Um, that can be a starting point for any of you. If there's somebody in your in your library or in your school district who doesn't really know what this is and was wondering what you're um, all about, <laughs> it could maybe be a, a way to get them um, used to the ideas here. Um, we also want to note that we're going to be sending around links to the recordings of all of this so that you have it, links to the resource sheets that we've created on the fly, so you'll be able to have access to that. We also did a resource sheet like this back in August, and we've made a version of that that can be available to all, so we'll send that around too. And um, just, um, of course, a big thanks to the McCormick Foundation. Um, it really wouldn't have been possible to do all this work without that funding. So we're really grateful that they were able to take a chance on this. This was not through their education program. This is through their democracy program. They just really are recognizing how important these issues are to protecting our democracy and ensuring that our citizenry feel empowered and, and connected to um, this kind of information. So we'll put the survey in the chat and feel free to chat to each other, hellos and goodbyes, and we'll meet again. And um, I'm just so happy to see you all and looking forward to hopefully someday being together um, in person, but I'm sure I'll see you online as well. So thanks so much, everybody.